The uh, Martin Simon was a sociologist who also had, uh, well, Herbert Simon was a, was a mathematician and economist as well. Um, we talk about systems of coordinating action. Oh, I see that it really doesn't work very well because here it sounds much better. So I, I will have to be here. So March and Simon, uh, so, so we talked about uh, synchronizing uh, ways that you can work together uh, when the price system fails and uh, way getting collective effort, collective action together, as March and Simon say. So basically, organization is going to have to do two things, okay? And on both things, information technology is going to matter. Uh, and the two things are this. First, I want you to think of all the members of the organization as if they were saints. They don't have any behavioral biases. They don't have any uh, incentive conflicts. They all want to do the right thing. Now, would people need coordination when they want to do the right thing? Yes, for sure, right? You want... Uh, two people to do something together, even if they are well-intentioned. One person has different knowledge or different information than the other. They want to do it in one way. The other person wants to do it in the other way. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they are trying to do it in their own interest. Okay? So the first type of problems organizations have to solve are coordination problems. And they have to do generally with different information and different knowledge that different people have that prevents them from working together or from solving a problem. So one person needs to solve half, and the other person needs to solve half, and they actually need to, to, to coordinate uh, with each other. That's a coordination problem. Now, there is a second problem, which is that people are not angels. And you know that uh, well, and you've studied a lot of, of, of uh, microeconomics probably by now, and you know that um, you need ways to get people to be motivated for their own, for the common good. Now. The price system does both of those things very often very well. Okay? There are many things that you can do with prices, both in terms of coordinating people and in terms of motivating people. In fact, most of the time, we tend to think that uh, the price system uh, can solve a lot of the problems of motivation and coordination. We can um, think of a shop, and there is a person there who is selling to us, and there is massive coordination problems. They need to have the amount of coffee that people are going to want to buy the following day. They need to be motivated not to cheat when you're going to pay and not to charge you too much. Um, both of those problems exist, and the person who owns the shop is going to, and you are going to solve it through the price mechanism. You go there, and you, you pay, and they are not going to sell you the wrong thing because they know they want you to come back the next day, and you're going to uh, have the right amounts of coffee. Um, all of that information that is required to have the right amount of coffee in the shop, the right amount of coffee, is going to be spread through the price mechanism. Um, if there is a freeze in Brazil and the coffee is more scarce, you and you and you maybe like coffee less and maybe you guys like coffee more, you have to stop consuming coffee. Uh, we could have no price mechanism. We could have an organization that says these 10 people don't consume coffee, but probably some of the people who will not be allowed to consume coffee actually love coffee very much. And the way you solve it, with the price system is you go to a supermarket, coffee prices are very high, you have no idea what happened in Brazil and you don't care, but you think, oh my God, for this price I prefer tea. And you think, no, I prefer to keep on buying coffee. So those two problems are often solved by the price mechanism, but organizations are, when the price mechanism fails, organizations are required. And they need to solve both of those things. They need to make sure that uh, people have the right information, have the right knowledge, transmit the right information, transmit the right knowledge, and are motivated to use it appropriately. Okay, we have monitoring. What do managers do? Managers coordinate. They make sure people work together. They uh, give people uh, the right knowledge to do their jobs, and they motivate, monitor people. So all of those things that I said. So in terms of coordination, some of the things that organization is going to do is make sure that utilization of knowledge is good. And as, as we said yesterday, um, for those of you who are here, um, the issue of the utilization of knowledge is, is one of the essential uh, parts of organization because knowledge is very expensive and the time of managers is limited. We don't have infinite time to be doing all of the, all of the things that we know how to do or that we could potentially do, so we specialize and different people do different things. Uh, 
Uh, communicating, transmitting information is crucial in that context because if we need to work together, we need to communicate, and of course, coordinating decision. You're going to do A, I'm going to do B, we're going to work together. The, the, uh, on, in terms of the motivation issues, there are two types of issues. Um, it would take me much more than my hour to explain you those two. I hope that most of you are, are familiar. I will, I will explain them in actual examples so as, I, so as not to have to go over all of it, but basically to just give you the, the basic idea. Uh, the two key motivation issues are people can't observe each other's behavior or can't observe each other's types, as, as, as we say in economics. So they cannot observe if you're a good person or a bad person, if you're a smart person or a dumb person, potentially, or if you are actually working that day or you're not working, you didn't show up. All those things are hard to observe. That's asymmetric information. One party to a transaction is potentially more important than the other. And the other motivation problem is a contractual incompleteness issue, which is that you can never write a contract that involves all the possible things that can happen in your life. And exposed, when something happens, the contract is not complete, people behave opportunistically. They have a motivation issue. In this case, they don't do what potentially you would have liked them to do or what they committed to do at the start because the contract didn't really say that. And as you know, this is something that it's really one of the key issues that economists have been looking at for the last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years, or maybe four decades. Um, contracts are stunningly incomplete. The, the most important contracts that you will sign in your life, which are your marriage contract and your work contract, uh, don't say anything about any of the important things that happen. Okay? In, the, in the marriage contract, it doesn't say who takes care of the kids. You don't bargain exante about who's going to stop working or who's going to work more. Are we going to get a nanny or you're going to get a nanny? All those things are talked over a glass of wine before the marriage. And exposed, exposed opportunism is pretty easy, right, to envision. You're already married. You have a kid, which is a common asset that you share. And it's very easy to see how expropriation opportunities arise, right, and asymmetries that, okay, I'm not going to take care of these kids. You'll see what you do with it, right? And so the other person is going to be like, okay, well, I don't seem to have a choice. So, so both the fact that contracts are incomplete and the fact that information is not complete means that there is a role for organizations in, in, in actually uh, determining the way economic activity is organized. So uh, to talk about the second, contracts are incomplete. So I don't know what I need you to do tomorrow. I couldn't write a contract that says, hey, tomorrow you have to come at nine, do this, do that, do that. So instead of that, what we do is I hire you, you're my worker, and tomorrow we'll decide what we do, depending on how many clients come, etc. So the organization is going to fill that hole, potentially, that the price mechanism is not really good at solving. And in terms of informational symmetries, similarly, instead of having a contract that tries to incentivize you to do the right thing, we put a manager on top who monitors you and makes sure you're working right. Okay, so that's the basic um, role of organizations said in five minutes, so uh, yeah, we could we could talk more maybe at at, at, at twelve forty five when when we do the when we finish. You guys have, have things that you want to discuss now. Technology, which is what these uh, three lectures are about, um, affects both of those things because at the end of the day, both things, both coordination issues and motivation issues, are really about information. Um, they, they, from a coordination perspective, the organization is really an information processing tool. There are all these people who have different pieces of knowledge, and they all need to work together and be informed. Well, if we have a computer that allows us to solve problems easier or allows us to communicate easier, etc., all of that is going to change the organization. In terms of motivation, of course, again, it's going to be the case that information technology is going to change the information that is available to know what people are, are they behaving opportunistically or are they not behaving opportunistically? So both of those things, um, for example, I want to give you an example later about truck driving. If I have, or Uber, right? If I have a technology like an accelerometer in an Uber car and I am Uber, I know whether you're driving well or badly, whether you are actually uh, braking all the time and giving an unpleasant service to customers. So it's easier to have drivers uh, and to know what they're doing and to avoid incentive conflicts when you have that information technology. So um, what I want to do is I want to discuss some of these ideas, put some ideas on the table, 
put some new things that I think would be interesting to think about in the context of automation um, and tell you, give you some empirical evidence and some examples to make you, to help you to think of how does technology change organization. In none of those things, um, the availability of information is going to sharply, sharply go in one direction or the other. We're going to see that because the market and the firm are very much about information, what information is available, how does it get processed, both of them are going to get affected importantly in, in potentially the two different ways by, by information. So let me start with the cost of coordination. So yesterday I introduced very briefly um, a view of hierarchies as vertical specialization. Let me just push it a little bit forward to talk about, about how information technology affects the jobs of managers. So I'll tell you uh, just literally this is all going, this is the entire amount of, of modeling I'm going to do, but it's going to give you at least a framework to think in, in, your, in your mind. So basically, what we're going to think is that the organization has a set of tasks. Let's say that there are uh, 10 tasks. Uh, here is the tasks between 0 and 1. And you need to decide how many are done by the manager and how many done by the worker. And what determines that? How do we think of delegation in a context where there's no motivation problem? There's no motivation problem, so it's just about <laughs> deciding how do we use knowledge optimally in this, in this context. So what happens is, Look, I need, uh, the worker can learn the tasks. He can do them themselves, okay? Um, or the manager can, do, can learn the task and, 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 do, and do the task themselves. So basically the question is, should I delegate knowing that I need to train you to make the good decisions, or should I do it myself knowing that then I can give you orders and you just have to do what, what I'm telling you? And the trade-off is going to be a trade-off between acquiring information and communicating information. You can basically train all these workers and let them acquire all this information that allows them to make good decisions. Or you can spend a lot of time communicating to them how to do each thing. So it's very easy to see. Um, I'm going to say, so it's giving of directions, right? Here I'm giving directions. Here the workers doing it themselves. So the worker who's very empowered, so lots of decisions are done by the worker. A worker who is very empowered will make decisions on their own. and if you, we want them to make good decisions, it's going to have to take a lot of time to train them. They have to be high-skilled workers. They need to have lots of information, etc. A worker who is not very empowered is almost like, you know, a, an automatic arm that is just pressing buttons. Then I need to tell all the staff, and then I need to spend a lot of time communicating. Um, so the optimal organization is going to balance communication and acquisition of information. They can acquire more information, or I can spend more time communicating. And so it's very clear, just from that very simple description, I hope, what information and communication technology are going to do. And they are going to do opposite things. That's the important thing I want to emphasize at this first point. Um, information technology is going to decentralize. It's going to empower people. You give people the ability to actually check themselves uh, online, the cases, find out what, the, for example, in law, what the case law is. The associate can find out with LexisNexis what case he's confronting or she's confronting. Then the partner is going to be much less involved. Workers are going to do things on their own. So information technology is going to decentralize. On the other hand, communication technology is going to centralize. It's going to mean, well, I have a perfect vision of everything that you're seeing. I can very cheaply communicate this information, then why would you need to be trained at a very expensive cost? So if communicating is very cheap, then I can just be firing emails all day telling everybody what to do. If communicating is very expensive, then you need to know what you're going to do. So basically, we're going to have two things that we can look empirically at, what happens with the spans of control and what happens with worker autonomy as technology changes. Um, I'm going to give you, so IT increases delegation, information technology increases delegations, makes managers more focused on non-routine work, on really exceptional things, and makes workers do more of, what, of, of the ta more tasks, okay? So let me give you a couple of examples. First example I was mentioning, LexisNexis. With LexisNexis, an associate in a law firm, so think of a world without LexisNexis. In a world without LexisNexis, uh, every time there was a traffic accident, you would go to the partner and ask, okay, how do I start? And the partner would tell you, okay, 
you need to find these cases, you need to, um, we're going to sue these persons, we're not to do that, you need to find out who is entitled to sue, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the associate goes online, does a search, finds traffic accidents which have these characteristics, and solves it themselves. So the information technology is an empowering tool. So let me give you two examples uh, uh, in the banking sec sector. So there are two papers by uh, uh, Jose Liberti Amitzeru, who was here, um, and Rick, uh, the first one, which says, <laughs> we're going to have um, a credit registry that allows people to know much more about the loan categories. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, the offices in the first row are going to be able to solve more problems, and they're going to need less uh, intervention from managers. Similarly, Daniel Paralicini and Antoinette Shore um, have a similar uh, idea, which is loan offices have credit scores. So this is in Peru, and the loan offices before would be making decisions based on what they think the credit risk is, and then there's a committee, etc. The committee has to meet whenever there's complications. Here, we're going to give them a credit score. So now it's a tool that allows the credit officer to put all the things, get an answer, and make a decision. So the credit officer is doing much more and needs much less help from above, okay? So the idea is technologies that allow more access to information, decentralized organization, give you, empower everybody, give you, devolve uh, decision-making down. Uh, the ones with knowledge make the decisions. If knowledge is more plentiful, people make decisions lower than the hierarchy, and we have less communication, larger span, etc. Now, um, does communication technology operate in the opposite way than information technology, and do those two things really uh, operate in the way we are suggesting? So, um, Nick Bloom, who is at Stanford, and Rafael Sadun, who is at Harvard, and John Van Rinan, who is now at MIT, and myself, uh, did some work with management data trying to figure out what IT, what information technology and communication technology do to film organization. Um, basically, this is the World Management Survey. It's an awesome survey. And I don't say it because I am in the paper because I didn't run the survey, okay? But I don't know how uh, Nick and John managed to talk uh, the Central Bank of, of China, the Bundesbank, the Treasury of the UK to endorse the survey, write to all these firms in all of these countries, and they enrolled uh, a big team of MBAs who were run of uh, the LSE, 78 MBAs, and they would be calling plan managers and then coding their answers uh, in a particular way. It was double blind, so two people would code the answer. There are uh, 6,000 firms across Asia, Europe, US, and South America, lots and lots of firms, and there is a lot of information. This course, the World Management Service course, are available uh, in, uh, you are curious, if you ever want to see uh, how firms are managed in, in different countries and how decentralized are, how centralized, how much incentive they use, whatever it is, there is a website for the World Management Survey in Stanford. You can just put WMS, and this survey has now been made publicly available. Now, what we did is we put together this management survey with IT, inter information and communication technology data, data on how, um, what kind of technology and how is technology used in a lot of firms. Obviously, not all the firms in our data, we had data from information technology, but when we merged it, we still had plenty of data left. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to see, is it the case that communication technology tends to centralize the organization and put the power on the, on the, on the, on the center because then the the boss is basically kind of running everything from above, and this is the case that information technology tends to empower people in the centralized. So for communication technology, we had LAN, network uh, uh, measures, and for information technology, we had for workers, the existence of CAD CAM software, which allows prototyping and allows workers and plants to design, produce products from, from, uh, from that information, and for the managers to see if they are empowered from above, we used ERP, which provides which provides real-time information on production, on the stock, on quality, on sales, uh, very good information technology in terms of very real-time detailed information technology. Um, ERP could be confusing, uh, could also allow, provide more communication technology, but we actually kind of, uh, we produce some more data that, that uh, reassures about that distinction in this particular technology. What we find is that, um, 
Indeed, information technology empowers plan managers. They get more decisions from above when there is ARP. Network tends to centralize. They get less power. And those things exist even when you're controlling for personal computers. So it doesn't seem to be technology. And they operate in different directions, whether they're separate or together. So it was kind of reassuring that that's, mo that's what is happening. When you look at autonomy of workers, you get the same idea. Workers with information technology get more empowered, and with communication technology, they get less empowered. In both cases, the spans are increasing uh, with the uh, information technology. The communication technology doesn't really come very, very clearly or uh, uh, almost not significantly at all. So first idea, information technology, information communication technology is not a simple, OK, this is what it does. It has at least two really important aspects, which are information communication, which push in opposite direction. I wanted to put on the table an idea that I've been thinking about lately and that I think is, is important for the way that work jobs are changing, which is the idea of managers as translators in the context of big data. So problem solving used to be what managers did. In the model I showed you, all problem solving is there by managers. Machines themselves don't do any problem solving, or workers. Now, the key thing that has changed with machine learning is that machines can directly learn and solve problems. So what do managers do? What are you guys going to do when information technology is doing all this stuff? So what do I mean by machine learning? I mean, you guys have uh, taken your stats, or if you haven't, you have to. Uh, so supervised learning, which is what we used to do, I mean, what, what, what economists mostly do, what, what, what people did in, have usually done in statistics, like uh, linear regression, but many other tools. Basically, what you do with artificial intelligence is you put a training set, you run your machine learning, um, you want to predict churn. You see that in the bank there's lots of churn. Clients are just leaving all the time. You're wondering why do they leave? So you have a model with all the characteristics of these clients, the balance sheet, everything, and you figure out, can I predict who leaves? And what you do in machine learning is you get a training set to get an algorithm that predicts who is going to churn, and then you get a testing set to figure out who is, uh, whether your prediction is working. It's important to have these two types of tests because people here in these fields, statisticians and engineers who do these algorithms, are pretty skeptical about causality. They don't try to get a causality. So with an algorithm like this, you could uh, decide that carrying umbrellas is dangerous for the rain because it increases the probability of rain. There is absolutely nothing in your data that decides if rain causes umbrellas or umbrellas cause, or cause rain. So anything that is correlated is going to show up there. So you need to then get your training set and go in data which you haven't used and try to see if you can predict uh, uh, your results. Still, causality is a big issue here, and, and, and you need some, some experimentation potential. Unsupervised learning, we are all familiar from all our work every day, right? Everything that we do here, boom, something comes out, a recommendation, uh, see this advertising, um, purchase this product, etc. What's happening there? The data is being processed by Google, and they are putting us in categories, okay, continuously. And it's deciding that people who are in Hyde Park but came from O'Hare probably tired and need a coffee, okay. Um, and then boom, the ad for coffee comes up, okay. So that's unsupervised learning. The coolest thing for me, and the really thing that I think is gonna is really changing the world, is is reinforced learning here. We tell the computer, we don't tell the computer anything like, here is what we want you to do. But we tell the computer, here is a win and here is a lose. Here is a success and here is a failure. For example, the famous example, and you can see the paper because it, it's very readable. Anybody can read it. The AlphaGo chess matches of a, a, a year ago where AlphaGo crashed uh, the best computer program um, Ah, the name escaping me now. It was an IBM, I think. Uh, the best computer program that had existed ever, the previous computer program was programmed the old-fashioned way. If the queen is doing this, then do that. I mean, basically, look forward, try to optimize, try to um, uh, do the right thing, etc. The AlphaGo didn't do that. AlphaGo is simply told, you are going to get one point if you win and zero points if you lose. If you lose and two AlphaGo engines were put against each other and just let them play and play and play and play again. And eventually they come up with an algorithm that puts a value function that says what's the value of every move. So you're there, 
you have a horse here and the computer algorithm says, let's move it this way because that's a value, higher value. It's a complete black box, okay? You have no idea why it did that and you cannot open the hood and look inside with a reinforced learning algorithm and figure out why the hell did it decide to move the horse there. It just decided that was the higher value. So with those three types of tools, what you have is the possibility of, imagine this churn or this, uh, or this recommendation or uh, putting images which have cancer or no cancer, where you want to say, uh, here are the, the cases of cancer, here are the cases of no cancer, and just show them x-rays and x-rays until the machine is going to know. In all of these cases, the machine is the problem solver. So what is our job? What is the job of managers? What do managers do? So I think that the, the best way to think about it is managers as translators. I'm working with, with some, a McKinsey team on this idea. And McKinsey actually calls them translators, which I was very happy because I wrote a paper on managers as translators in 2006, uh, which basically says the following thing. So basically, the idea is this. Different areas of knowledge of different codes. So if you're an engineer, you know about curves and about differential equations, about um, final values and initial values and boundary values and paths and reinforcing loops, etc. And that's the way you think and that's the way you do things. And if you're a marketing person, you know about market shares and prices and price discrimination, etc. Those categories are often incompatible and they limit the ability of people inside the organization to communicate. So think of the, my favorite example is a product design manager. Product design manager is somebody who's going to decide if this next phone for uh, the next Samsung I have here, Note, if not Note 10 is going to be this big or bigger, is going to have a bottom here or no bottom, is going to have three screens, has a horrible, I don't know if you guys have Samsung, it has a Bixby bottom here, which occupies a lot of real estate, and I don't know anybody who used the Bixby thing. It's an artificial intelligence, a robot. So who decides that? Well, we know how engineers are, okay? They speak their own language, and they're like, oh, it's cool, we put this bottom here, it does all these things, etc." And marketers are going to be like in their world, thinking about market shares and what consumers want and blah, blah. Those two worlds don't talk to each other, okay? So a role of managers in this context is to translate, is to understand what engineers really meaning when they talk about how cool this bottom is, etc., and to translate it to the marketeers and to translate the concern of the marketeers so the engineers can do it. Now, why do I say this in the context of artificial intelligence? So when you're doing machine learning, and when problem solving is done by machines and not by managers, what happens is the, out, the, the questions have to be posed and the problems have to be specified and the machines need guidance on what the interesting answers are. And you cannot outsource this. You cannot just tell to a consultant, well, tell me why I have a lot of churn. You need to know what information is relevant, what information do you have the 31st of the month when you're going to do, or which day are you going to make the decision on what kind of things to offer the consumers? What kind of decision tools do you actually have? Because maybe they tell you answers that you can't control. So what McKinsey uses and what other firms use without calling them like this is the idea of a translator. And so managers in this artificial intelligence context are going to be, or in this machine learning world, part of what they do is, apart from problem solving, and apart from all the other things we're going to discuss, is be able to speak like you guys the business language, to be able to say, what do we actually care about? What's a good number that I would like to know in order to fix the price? What are interesting parameters? And in order to be able to actually speak to the data guys, ask the right questions to the, to the data, figure out what's the relevant information you're gonna have, design the model, review the model, and convince people to actually make a decision based on the model. You need to understand the model now to make the decision. You need to actually figure out can I trust what the model is telling me? Do I understand what information the model has, etc.? So, a, a second thing uh, that uh, that uh, apart from kind of information technology changing how the organization is because it allows you to solve problems, um, information technology and, and communicate. Information technology is going to allow you to actually through machine learning get solutions, and you still, as managers, as humans, are going to have a role, which is to try to bridge that gap. In, in the McKinsey Center, where I was, where I was uh, thinking of this, you know, the, the difference is very clear, right? You have the, the five rows of uh, guys in a T-shirt with a cap and the sneakers who are physicists or mathematicians, and they wouldn't know a demand curve if, they, if it jumped on them. 
And then, of course, you have on the other side, you have the associates and the consultants and the partners who uh, don't know Python. And especially if you get a partner from McKinsey from 40, 45 years old, you can imagine they, couldn't, they wouldn't have any idea of what these algorithms are. And so the possibility that you get an assignment from Procter & Gamble who says, okay, I want to introduce a new shampoo and I want to understand my data on why are people stopping buying this shampoo. The possibility of these actually talk to each other is very limited and people who are actually able to at least know enough of the information of, of, the, of the tool can, can take that, that uh, role. So here, information technology is pushing you to a new role. You're no longer solving the problem. You are actually running the machines that are going to give you a solution and making sure that you're posing the question. Um, so that's the coordination world. This is a world where information technology, what it does is it gives us in communication technology, machine learning, automation, it gives us knowledge and information that is actionable and we can make decisions with it. I wanted to briefly discuss a second type of, of issue that I mentioned at the start, which is motivation and incentive conflicts. Here, what technology allows us to do is it allows us to potentially observe much more information about the behavior of people and as a result changes completely the contracting environment. So um, it potentially makes for uh, much more or much less conflict or more incentive conflict free environment where we actually uh, can observe much more of what people are doing. So think of the Uber example I was giving you before. Um, you can actually have information about the driver, the customer satisfaction instantaneously, the uh, way he's driving or she's driving, the speed, uh, everything about the experience can actually be recorded in a way that before was impossible. That reduces information asymmetries, and I'll show you how it changes uh, contracting uh, in an important way. But also, information technology is allowing us to contract at, at, at longer, at longer um, distances, and it's allowing us to produce all these platforms where, like Booking and, and Uber, et cetera, et cetera, where contracting takes place in an anonymous way, potentially reintroducing asymmetric information. So um, the first thing I, I wanted to discuss is the incomplete contracting and the idea of how boundary uh, of the firm has to do with these informational issues. So basically, you have always a choice. Think of a flower shop, okay? Just in order to not talk too much about, about the theory. Think of, think of a flower shop. A flower shop can be owned by a mom and pop or can be owned by a chain. And what's going to tell you whether the flower shops are all together owned by a uh, chain or are separate owned by a mom and pop? Largely, there's a lot of decisions which are non-contractable, like the marriage. And what happens is ownership incentives are very strong, and they allow you to extract effort and dedication that you couldn't do in a firm. The mom and pop flower shop, when you invite them to come to your house for the wedding, they look at the house, they look at the church, they decide on the flowers, they talk to you, they go all out, right? There are a lot of things that an employee of the flower shop chain would be hard-pressed to do. For example they have to throw away all the flowers which are not fresh. That's kind of difficult to do because it costs money, right? If you're paying somebody uh, a commission, if you're paying somebody a salary, uh, and you tell them minimize your cost, they're not going to be wanting to throw flowers, which means they're going to have flowers which are not very nice in the wedding. How do you avoid that? It's very hard to avoid. Ownership avoids that because there's a person who has a reputation, who wants to have a pretty flower show in the, in the wedding, who is going to make many more weddings and owns this, this store. So the idea is that ownership incentives are very, very powerful. And they make people do things that they couldn't do if they were in a hierarchy. So um, how does information technology change this? Well, imagine that you could see what the people in the flower shop are doing. Imagine you had a camera and you could see every flower. Or imagine that you could put an implant on the flowers to see how fresh they are. Clearly, the ability of the flower mom and pap to survive would be much smaller because then the chain would make much more sense. That's what happened to Blockbuster. Blockbuster was a video chain, uh, was, was a video chain store that substituted all the video stores because once you have all the information technology, a chain could have as much information about the clients and what they wanted to do and what they wanted to buy 
as the mom and pop. So I, I'm going to give you one concrete example, which is drivers. It's a truck drivers. It's very much like an Uber example I gave you. So a truck, owning a truck a chain of truck driving, a, a multiple trucks is scary, right? Because the truck drivers might be drunk and they might run into a truck, into a bus and kill all the kids. Who knows? I mean, all sorts of horrible things can happen, right? So normally this has been a very fragmented industry. Everybody owns their own truck and that's their problem. You just hire with them. Of course, there are some advantage of the chain in terms of you can, if you're a chain, you can get a, a howl one way and a howl the other way, and you can match the howls better. The trucks are going to be fuller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, you get a new computer like in Uber, which is onboard computing. Onboard computing allows you to measure exactly what the truck driver is doing, whether he's stopping after eight hours, whether he's sleeping, whether he's driving too fast, or what time he's driving, what time he's sleeping, all of the things that you want to know in order to contract. So logically, what you expect is there is less incentive conflicts, there is lower moral hazard risk, and as a result, you expect to see more, uh, the incomplete contract is less incomplete, the incentives can be more easily provided, the firm can actually do that. And indeed, what uh, Tom Hubbard uh, and, and, and Jerry Baker showed is that, um, George Baker, show is that onboard computer has increased non truck ownership, so basically firms grow bigger. And you can see that uh, in, in many segments of the economy where you're seeing chains replace mom and paps throughout. And we, so we talked yesterday some about that, uh, how uh, part of the increasing concentration is local shops, local retail being replaced by chains, as we have less and less of a use for somebody who has this special information and who knows exactly what the customer needs because we can just standardize all that. Uh, information. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to mention briefly is uh, platforms allow for, uh, by allowing for more, uh, for, for trade, which is more anonymous, they could be introducing informational asymmetries. Now, if you think from an informational asymmetry perspective of eBay, Booking, Uber, they all have the same characteristic. Um, and, and I think you all understand. Why would, why would taxis exist? Taxis assist because it's very scary to go into the car of an anonymous person, just sit on that car and be exposed to whatever they want to do to you. Now, the state, the city, whomever gives a license and says, this person I certified is a good person, been driving for many years, and if they stop doing well, they're going to lose their license, which is a, they've invested a lot. Now, with all this information that we now have, it's possible to have reputational mechanisms that get rid of that. Hotels. Why do you go to Hyatt or to a Marriott? Because you know that if it's the Mario chain, the Mario chain has a standard and it's going to enforce that quality. Now, again, booking.com, et cetera, allows you to have a measure of quality that re eliminates all those inf incentive conflicts and allows you to a contract on these platforms in an anonymous way. Now, of course, how much information the platform has relative to the spot market, to the old market, it's a question that has been debated and how much new incentive conflicts are introduced. I'm going to show you two platforms. One is um, one that I studied with Steve Kaplan, who's a professor here uh, at the start. It was the, one of the first B2B platforms. It was basically an auction for a, a, a site that these auctions for cars. So you go as a dealer. Before, the way you did it was you went, you drove the car to the auction, you sell the car in auction, and you take the car with your truck, you sell it there, somebody goes from another dealership, gets it. These are dealer to dealer auctions where basically you would have too many red cars, you need green cars, you have too many rovers, you need GMs, whatever it is. Of course, you can imagine how the platform works because it works exactly like, like many platforms we've seen uh, in B2C uh, more recently. Uh, you don't have to carry the car. You are at home, you go online, you are a dealer, you look at the cars, um, you um, bid for the car and the car only gets transported from you to the person for, to the other dealer. Uh, we actually, Steve and me, uh, calculated how much transaction cost is reduced, a lot, how much bigger the market is, and how much more liquidity, a lot. And we then went wondering, like you would wonder with Uber and with Booking, etc., to what extent the reputational mechanisms of the site actually eliminate moral hazard and allow for these uh, platforms to work. And again, what you find is that information technology has eliminated mostly the, the, the incentive conflict by creating these reputations we found that there was no difference uh, in the risk of, ch of cheating, even though the dealer cannot actually see the car and see that the car is working. So 
what you see again here is um, information uh, is reducing incentive conflicts. However, what you see is that in many of these cases, it's creating platforms where people can trade rather than changing the boundary of the firm and making more trade inside the firm. So um, both, both of those effects can happen when information problems uh, are reduced and incentive conflicts are, are eliminated. I wanted to tell you an, a, a, an example from exactly 10 years ago where the platform trading went really badly, right? So we don't think of a platform trading of the securitization industry, but that's what essentially it was. Um, you used to have a mortgage in your book and you were a bank, persons came, you would look at their uh, ability to pay over the next 30 years, and if they were had ability to pay, you would give them the mortgage. If they didn't have the ability to pay, you wouldn't give it. So you had the incentive conflicts that we've been talking about, more hazard and adverse election, and I encourage you to take classes with Mike Gibbs and many others here, which go over those in weeks instead of minutes. Uh, those problems were, would be solved because the bank would really have an incentive to look at those things. Now, what you get with all this standardized trading and these platform uh, trades is that it's a situation where all of this is separated, like in Uber and like in Booking, in the market. There is a person who's the borrower. He, there is this guy who's driving around California issuing mortgages, gives it to this person. Then the issuer is somebody who uh, packages all these things and issues a, a, a loan, a, a bond with all these loans, to, backed by all these loans. And this asset manager buys these loans and sells it to the investor who is any of you. So there are five levels. There are all these other companies. Um, <clears throat> what happens, uh, what happened in the financial crisis, uh, and this is a, a report from the New York Fed that looked at this, at this chain. Once you take out all of this out of the firm and you put it in the market and you have all of these people uh, separate, uh, a lot of problems emerged. And it's a good, this paper is a good way to read about moral hazard and adverse selection because it has it all. Basically, this borrower um, maybe is really a drunk person who has not ever worked and who is a terrible risk. This originator has uh, moral hazard in really checking because he's going to pass the loan back. So the originator has moral hazard, maybe makes mistakes. Here, there's adverse selection because the originator might keep some of the loans and only put in this package the loans that are really terrible. Uh, this issuer, again, holds some of the loans in his own books and passes to the asset manager some loans, probably the worst loans. And the investor is not going to really monitor here uh, at the asset manager so we can have more hazard. There were three solutions that the market had come up with, which was rating agencies, insurers, and services. And all of these three solutions uh, actually in the crisis itself failed. I would imagine that now they're working better. The insurers... Would, it would, would, buy, would give you insurance on this loan, uh, like AG, um, uh, AIG. The rating agency would tell you these loans are good. The servicer would be somebody who would be collecting the loan payments. So here you have a situation where more hard information is available. We are more able to um, see what everybody, uh, the hard characteristics, the objective characteristics of the loans, and in this case, what we have is the soft information that the clerk was getting in the mortgage and just talking to the client was superior to the information or at least uh, solved some of these incentive conflicts better or at least the claim by the New York Fed is that it solved those incentive conflicts better than this decentralized chain that was more like the platforms that we are recently used to seeing. So I would... <laughs> I would say that, just to, to summarize some of these ideas, I covered a lot of space, but some, some of it is, 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 is uh, uh, relatively straightforward, I hope. So first of all, uh, first idea, the idea that information and communication technology do different things. Information technology is going to affect the role of managers by empowering people down the hierarchy and devolving people tools to make decisions. So the better the information technology, the more you have a decentralized structure with larger spans, with uh, less layers, with people able to take the decisions down. Communication technology is going to centralize organizations because it allows, um, I, I remember, and it just, it just assaulted me, this, this example, because I saw the movie very recently again. This movie, which is called Black Hawk Down, you might have seen about some soldiers in Mogadishu who 
get um, lost uh, when they're trying to catch ID, the, a, a terrible guy. And um, it was a warlord. And there was the colonel of the helicopter unit actually trying to direct the, the, the soldiers from above. The communication technology is sufficiently good that the soldier is not making the decision over whether to turn right or left based on what he sees, but the officer is making the decision because he can actually uh, communicate more cheaply. Of course, it goes terrible because all those communications are not, not working. A third thing that I haven't shown you any data, but I, I hope at least I am doing, I'm doing a project where I hope to get something to say about this, is this idea of translation. Um, the idea of translation basically is that uh, managers' roles are increasingly changing from problem solving and uh, using their brain and their hunches to actually solve things to posing the right question and being able to talk the language of business to understand problems and to understand uh, and to understand the world of data and, and how uh, artificial intelligence machine learning works. In that sense, and that's, that's something that I, I wanted to just leave as a thought for you, um, I think having that familiarity with what machines are doing is, is very important for, for the future. Um, and then information technology and the availability of information is also going to change incentive conflicts and asymmetric uh, and, and, and incomplete contracting. Essentially, it's making monitoring and measuring more uh, available. That's not necessarily going to always reduce the, I mean, you have to look at the explicit problem to see whether it's going to make more or less use of the free model market, as I showed you with two contrary examples. And it's not always going to work as fantastically. I showed you one example, which is a little bit of a, of a warning, uh, uh, which is the one of the credit uh, securitization. But essentially, um, by hardening information, it makes incomplete contracts less incomplete. And by um, allowing better monitoring of agents' performance, it allows for contracting to be uh, more free of more hazard and of asymmetric information problems. And as a result, uh, might increase the size of firms, as we saw with truck, drive, truck drivers, there's less of a reason for the truckers to own. But there also allows for these platforms, larger platforms, to appear where buyers and sellers are actually using the market. Um, so the the the, the you, you have to really look at what is the specific incentive conflict. Let me just go actually to, to, to make this point again, to the comparison between Blockbuster and Flowers. The same guys who did the video chain store when Blockbuster went badly, they actually wanted to roll up flower stores. They thought information technology makes information available the same way as I had information on what videos people in Hyde Park wanted to see because they want to see the same ones as in Stanford. And I have technology that allows me to see what they are watching in Stanford. The same way that video technology allows me to do, uh, IT allows me to do that, I'm going to do that for flower shops. So I'm going to be able to centralize uh, flower buying. I'm going to be much better at um, knowing delivery schedules, uh, cost control is going to be better, etc. And I will replace these mom and pop owners for just workers who are salaried workers in the same way as video stores had a mom and pop guy who was kind of relatively qualified, and then you got some guy who's a clerk who's like, oh, and doesn't really know anything, just is going to push the, 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 the flower, the, <laughs> the video through the scanner. They wanted to do the same with flowers. And if you go through what is the informational asymmetry problem that ownership is solving in that particular case, and what's the hard thing to contract, and you agree with the statements that we were making here, which are, well, Throwing away flowers is hard. How throwing away flowers is hard to contract, and technology doesn't let you really know which flowers are fresh. Making a pretty call, a pretty arrangement for a funeral or for a wedding is going to be very hard to contract. How do you contract on the creativity of this clerk, and how do you know he's really putting the effort and making it very pretty? Then you can guess that the roll-up of the flower market went badly, and indeed, the same guys who had been extremely successful with Blockbuster failed in applying information communication technology to rolling up the video market. So you really need to understand exactly what is the information problem in order to actually figure out what information technology is going to do to the relevant incentive conflict and whether it's going to go away. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> any questions? Anybody wants to discuss any of these examples or offer and alternatives? Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the incentive problems that could come about from automation. So 
uh, there was actually a recent Atlantic article that talked a lot about how, uh, you know, people would be self-automating their jobs, you know, they had some spreadsheet they had to fill in with numbers every month instead of going and downloading all the data from various places, they just had some, built some app that did it for them. And then they wouldn't tell their managers because then they're like, well, I have no work to do now. Uh, and so what, what kinds of things can managers do to try and incentivize people to do these productivity enhancing self-automation things? without sort of ruining their job. Now, you're giving a great example where ownership works, right? With ownership, you're, if you are a consultant, you're selling your spreadsheets to other people. Um, if you want to automate it and you think that's going to save you money, that's fine. The people who are going to get the product don't care. They just want the spreadsheet to be correct. So there you, you have an example where what the example you're giving, there is a very important and observable decision that is very hard to contract upon. And you're going to have to uh, write contracts uh, if you want to prevent people from doing that, that you can't actually actually uh, monitor. So it's, I, I, I hadn't thought of that example. I would say um, the, um, uh, most of the time, information technology is giving, you, is giving the bosses much more information what you're doing in your time. They know what emails you send, how much time you're online, how much time you're offline, when do you log in, when do you log off every day, how many keywords you pressed, and how many calls you made. Uh, my sense is that overwhelmingly, the kind of problem you're talking about is going to be much smaller, I think, than the problem of, because the AI tools are going to be most of the time centralized, and it's going to be very hard for workers to actually be able to, to, to manipulate them. So overwhelmingly, the AI is going to give more rather than less uh, con ability to control, and as a result, I would imagine it's going to solve rather than create that kind of new problem. Thank you for the beautiful talk. So my question is, say I'm a data scientist, and I'm creating a model, and I'm working on my features and feature engineering, in regards to the AI translator, would that be the person that would help me with that? So if you're a data scientist and you are working on your model, um, you a priori potentially, so you're studying a problem which is like, um, let's, let's look at this banking churn problem because it's one that, that, that we are all familiar with. So uh, you're the data scientist, a priori you don't know anything about banks and you don't know anything about churn and you don't know anything about clients and you don't know anything about behavioral issues and why people change or why people get bored and etc. And, and there is a guy who's been working on the bank for 20 years and doesn't know a computer from a pencil and yet that person uh, is going to be able to say well you know clients always when they when they uh, when when we when 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 they drop out tends to be after we have sent them this kind of they are going to allow you to formulate hypotheses. We, we send them this kind of information, or we are upset about something with their credit record. We call them home. They are going to know the client. They're going to have a lot of soft information to allow you to formulate the hypothesis. But then you're going to come up with solutions which don't make any sense. Solutions which are like, well, people drop out the last day of the month, and the person who really knows banks is going to say, oh, of course it's the last day of the month. That's not relevant for information, because we only collect churn the last day of the month. So yes, congratulations you found something that it's the way we code the data. So you didn't find anything at all. So you need somebody who actually knows the business very well in order to be able to add value. So the translator is the person who's actually able to, to pose the question. And I mean, when, we are, when you're at, at Booth, one thing that we always tell you is um, what is hard is to pose questions, right? I mean, to, um, to have a sense of an answer that matters, you need to have posed a good question. And if the question is, which day of the week is the churn, and the, 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 that day of the week is actually done by some other process, then the question is just terrible. So um, the translator is, uh, I, I don't think it's a transitional figure. I mean, you could say, well, look, MBAs are going to eventually go know so much about big data in 20 years or 10 years or something that they will not need anybody programming. But I think that's unlikely because technology moves so fast one fact came up in a paper just a couple of weeks ago, which I think is really beautiful. You know that STEM, returns to STEM are the highest returns to human capital investment? It turns out 10 years later, the, the investment has depreciated by half.
Okay? So STEM investments depreciate really, really, really quickly. People go to college, they learn everything about Python, and it turns out in 10 years, nobody's using Python, they're using who knows what other computer program, and everything that you learn is useless. So um, what you learn in, in, in Booth is, doesn't depreciate at all. It's forever. Economies of scale will always exist, even in 50 years, there will be economies of scale. And as informational asymmetries. Um, so, uh, because depreciation is so fast, there's always going to be new technology tools and new technology that you're going to need. And I think, I mean, if we change from actual uh, learning of organizations to thinking about careers, uh, which is what your question was pointing, I think you always need to know enough technology to be able to guide those questions. You need to know a lot about business, but you need to know at least what tools are available and what tools can allow you to, to give that answer. And that means you have to be basically working on your masters for the rest of your life. I mean, seeing YouTube and, uh, and learning about all these things um, continuously, I would imagine. Hi. Uh, so, excellent talk. I think it uh, summarizes the economic literature we have so far in this. I want to push you a little bit on uh, questions ahead. So, you framed these information and communication technological changes as in some sense, moving a target. There's what was optimal in the past. There's what's optimal today. Uh, so the target is moving. What do you see as the role of these technological changes in converging to that target, either at the firm level or the aggregate level? Um, we're going to talk a lot. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, tomorrow is about productivity, and it's about how firms are not getting the, the, the results that they should be getting out of this technology. Where are the boundaries to adopting? So let me uh, tell you, it's not just that I will touch on it, but that will be the point of tomorrow's lecture. What's the productivity gains and why is productivity slowing down and why are we not getting to that target if you want? So if you, if you don't mind, uh, that way I can just get you to come tomorrow. Maybe there's no pizza, but maybe there's no pizza, but there will be something uh, equally appetizing. Uh, it's one o'clock, so if there is no more questions, thank you very much. See you tomorrow.